Hello, my name is John Fisher and this is Ord in Burma. Welcome, welcome. Now as always with these stories, it helps immensely if you make sounds at home. If you help me with the sounds, it draws me into it and I can hear them. I can hear them even from here. I can hear the remote sounds. So we have some new sounds this week. First of all, we have an elephant. It sounds like a bugle, like a trumpet. So try that at home. Yeah. Oh, good. Good, I heard that. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Better than mine. Wonderful elephant sounds. We also have a flowing river. Very simple, however you interpret it. Let's hear some flowing rivers. Yep. Good, good, good group. Wonderful group. Lots of enthusiasm. It's informing my performance. Also, we have the usual explosions. <laughs> explosions, please. No, yes, wonderful. And machine gun fire. <laughs> Go crazy. Do some machine guns. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. And you can do the gestures too. You can participate. And I feel it. I do. That's wonderful. All right. Ord in Burma. So let's begin with some dramatic music. Yes, that's good. So, General Ord Wingate, Ord in Burma. This is the story of my fighting the Japanese behind Japanese lines in Burma during World War II. Welcome to Ord in Burma. <laughs> Ord Winkett here. Ord Winkett. We're crossing the Irrawaddy River in Burma tonight. We're a hundred miles behind Japanese lines and we have to get back. We're out of food, we're out of supplies. We must get across the river. It's a half mile wide and the current is strong and most of my men don't swim, but we must get across tonight, we must. So I lead my men down to the riverbank and I hand out the floats, the inflatable rafts, and we start across the river in our dinghies, moving slowly, because we know the Japanese are nearby. The Japanese surround us, and if they hear us, if they hear us, they'll take action. We hear things. In the middle of the river, we hear things. What do we hear? What do we hear? What do we hear? We're hearing things in the middle of the river, and then all of a sudden, from the Japanese side of the river, from the other side that we're trying to get to, a flare flies up into the sky, illuminating everything, and suddenly Japanese machine guns go off. And my men, my poor men, my men are stuck in the middle of the river, swimming for their lives, swimming for their lives. They can't swim, they can't swim. And some of them leave the dinghies behind, and I tell them, swim, swim for your lives. <laughs> The Japanese are shooting, 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 and we're approaching the far side of the river where we came from, where we tried to escape, but the Japanese are shooting at us, shooting at us, and some of them then get hit, <laughs> and they sink beneath the waves. And other men get tired. They're not very good swimmers. They can barely swim, and they expire. They begin to sink beneath the waves themselves. Sink beneath the waves! No! 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 And the rest of us make it, and we make it, and we get to the other side. And I think, damn! Damn, we've failed. And we lay there on the banks of the Irrawaddy. We didn't cross it. We're still a hundred miles behind Japanese lines, and the Japanese are between us and home, firing their guns. 
as the sun rises in the morning, we realize that we are prisoners of the sun. Trapped under the rising sun still, we didn't make it. We didn't make it. And I tell the men, disperse, disperse, try and get back as best you can. Go to India, go to China, disperse, try and get back as best you can. We failed. We failed. Six months earlier, the Japanese had invaded Burma in February 1942 as part of a much larger campaign to take over the entire Pacific Basin, Asia and Southeast Asia. It was a massive assault. I was called in because I was an expert on the special night squads. I led them in Palestine, attacking the Arab rebels behind enemy lines, sneaking back there and attacking them on behalf of the Zionists. I also fought in Ethiopia in long range penetration, going in there to put the Emperor Haile Selassie back in charge. I was an expert on going behind enemy lines, so I was called in to help. The situation in Burma was a disaster. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese began their conquest. The first thing they did was they knocked out the US Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. All the battleships were knocked out of action. The Pacific Fleet was rendered powerless. It could not help any of its allies anywhere in the Pacific. Next, they moved to Indonesia, then to the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, and eventually Burma. They were about to assault Burma, a colony of Great Britain. Now, Burma is basically a diamond-shaped country. And it shares borders on the south with Thailand, in the north with China, and in the east with India, also a British colony. Running through the middle of Burma, is the great river, the Irrawaddy, an impressive river, massive and important strategically. Nearby, a railroad which can supply the north from the south. Now, the Japanese attack came from the south out of Thailand and from the east out of Thailand, and it started to move north. It drove all of the British and Chinese out of Burma. It was a disaster, a massive, massive retreat out of Burma. Burma was lost in February 1942 and on through August. Push north, push north, push north. I was called in because they were putting together an offensive, an offensive that would be launched at the beginning of 1942. In the beginning of 1942, a massive offensive of British soldiers would be launched against Arakan, Arakan. Also north, another British offensive against Imphal. And finally, a Chinese offensive from China under the command of General Stilwell, an American general, would enter Burma. My force was supposed to come in and help. We were supposed to get in there and destroy things, destroy the, 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 the railroad, just destroy the bridges across the river. And I said, why wait? Why wait until the invasion begins? Why not let me go in early in my long range penetration? Why not let me go in with mules, sneak in, get in there, and then I'll be supplied by the air. And once I'm in there, I can destroy this railroad, blow it up. I can also blow up bridges across the Irrawaddy. I can destroy it. And that way, the Japanese won't be able to reinforce their forces in the north. We'll cut the Japanese forces in the north off from the south, and then we can eliminate them with these thrusts from the British and Chinese. General Wavell, my commander, said it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. He supported me 100% in this pursuit. And so I was going to bring victory to British defeat. There had been no victory, no victory, no victory in the Far East for the British forces. And the Americans were getting impatient. They wanted the British to win. And I said, we can, and I'll show them how with a long range penetration. I was set up. So General Wavell gave me the 77th Indian Brigade. Now this wasn't made up of Indians. It was made up of mostly British soldiers and Gurkhas and some Indians. 
Now the British soldiers, they come out from London, from England, and they were weak. They were soft men. These were not men that wanted to be in battle. No, that's not why they'd come out to India and Burma. So I knew that training, training would be vital. These were the kind of men, all they cared about was things like golf. Golf, anyone. That's why I came out uh, to be in the British Army, to play golf. Golf. Let's tee up and then we'll have tea. Tea before tea. Uh, where's my mashy nipnik? Oh yes, here it is, my good old mashy nipnik. Meet you at the fairway. They also loved sports like tennis. I have my ball, my ball, tennis, anyone, tennis, after golf, tennis. And of course, that old standby of the British Empire, they loved polo. Polo they adored. Oh, polo, love polo. I have polo ponies. I love to play polo on my pony. I even like to play water polo. My pony loves the water. Polo, anyone? Polo, let's hit somebody with the mallet. Taki, taki, taki. Mallet, 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 taki. These were soft, soft men. But I had to turn them into soldiers, fighting soldiers. And I knew the only way to do that was with exercise. Exercise. So I led them in military jumping jacks. Join me at home. One, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, three, two, three, four. Yeah, we keep doing that. Keep doing that as I talk. So as they trained, I also knew that I had to break them of some bad habits. One of them was laziness. Exercise was no use without marches, long marches. Endless marches, I knew that's what they needed. So we went on endless marches, marching about India, marching about the area of India up near the Chinwin River, marching, marching to train them to go a hundred miles behind Japanese lines. And finally, I knew that what we needed was intelligence. We needed to investigate. We needed to investigate everything. We needed to know everything about the Japanese. Everything we could find out, investigation, intelligence would tell us what the Japanese were going to do. And when we knew what they were going to do, we could anticipate their response. Also, we thought it was important that they learn about diet. No more roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. No, no more rice pudding, none of that. They need to learn to live without food, almost without food, in case our supplies didn't come in. I told them they should be able to exist on a diet of toads, lizards, and frogs. Toads, lizards, and frogs. I even trained them and how to capture a frog and eat it. Bibi, bibi, bibi. As I told them, it was very good to know about your stools. If you studied your stools in the morning, you would know about your health. Be an expert on your stools. Make your stools your friend. Examine them. Sniff them. Check their consistency. Every morning, get intimate with your stools. That way you know how your health was. If your stools were healthy, you were healthy. Healthy inside, healthy in the bowels, healthy outside, ready to fight. Also, I talked them about weapons. Weapons, and of course, the key weapon for the long range penetration for the night attack was the grenade. Always the grenade. Now this is an old grenade. A new one's even better, but I'll tell you something. The, the, the old ones work wonderfully. They work wonderfully, these old grenades. Wonderfully. They're magic. They're magic. Because even if they don't explode, they'll hit a Japanese soldier on the head, boom, and he'll think that they're going to explode. They're terrifying. The grenades are key. Also, I taught them about bombs. The efficacy of bombs. This is a bomb. This is a wick. Light the wick and throw the bomb. It's wonderful, even better than a grenade, because once they see that burning wick coming at them, they're terrified. They're terrified before it's even exploded. And the wonderful thing about these kind of bombs is, once they blow up, they make you cry. They bring tears to your eyes. I told them, no more smoking. I got rid of my cigarettes. I expected them to do so, too. Also, the key weapon was gangster fighting. Learn how to fight like a gangster. I taught them how to kick. I taught them how to kick low. Ah, kick low. Ah, kick low. Ah. Many of the other officers said that it was unpleasantly directed kicking. Kicking towards the vital. That was ungentlemanly. I said nonsense. Every soldier, be he German, Japanese, English, American, whatever, has a vital place. It's a vital place of his vitals, and that's the place we have to attack with. No kicking. No kicking. So our training continued. It continued mercilessly. Our strategy was we'd march in with the mules. 
we infiltrate with the mules. <clears throat> now the problem was, or one of the big problems was, we wouldn't be able to take the wounded out. If you were wounded, you'd have to be left behind. You'd only slow down the column. We were a column moving with mules. We could not take out the wounded. If you were wounded, you'd have to be left behind. It was heartbreaking. Especially since we didn't know if we could trust the Japanese to take care of our wounded. It was scary. But it was necessary. Also, if we were losing the battle, if we were being overwhelmed, the order would be disperse, break up and try and get back as best you can. Two unique orders. Not the nicest orders. But necessary. Necessary. How we would work is we would radio the RAF, the Royal Air Force. We would establish drop zones. They would drop us supplies. They would resupply us by air. Yes, our lines of communication were not horizontal. They were vertical. And you can't stop the vertical. No, you can't stop us being supplied. We called ourselves the Chindits, the Chindits, after the Chindi, those magnificent lions outside of Burmese temples. Those huge, ferocious lions with the wings, griffins. Yes, these are lions that can fly. That was us with our lions on the ground being supplied by the flyboys. We were griffins. We were Chindi. We were the Chindits. Also, our river, the river we launched from was the Chindwin. So it made sense that we would be the Chindits. And I was convinced the best thing we would do was liberate Burma. Burma for the Burmese. I'd done it for the Ethiopians. I'd done it for the Zionists. Now I wanted to give Burma back to the Burmese. There are many British officers who didn't agree with that. They didn't think we should be invading to turn Burma into a free Burma. They wanted it to be a British colony again. And these monocle wearing boobs would often confront me. See here, Wingit, how dare you talk about liberating the Burmese? How dare you? Sir, so, it's our job. We're no longer in this war to colonize people, to treat them worse than they're treated by the Japanese. We're here to free them and to give them freedom. Oh, nonsense. They were happier as British colonials. No, they weren't, sir. Haven't you noticed they formed a Burmese national army? Many Burmese are fighting for the Japanese, sir. They are fighting for the Japanese. They hate us. If we go in there now, we will liberate them for the Burmese. We will show them that we will truly give them freedom, that the Japanese are just fooling them, that we are there to help them. Nonsense, monarchs, monarchs, monarchs. Oh, you're a boob. You're a boob with a quarter in your eye. So much for talking with the staff, with the other generals. I also knew that the Japanese would be much tougher than the Italians. They'd driven the Chinese and the British and the Americans out of Burma, out of all of the East. I knew they'd be a tough lot to fight, but we'd had four months, four months of training, and I felt finally that the 77th were ready. The Chindits were ready. So I let the men celebrate Christmas. I let them turn on the radio and listen to their favorite songs. And of course that year, everybody's favorite song was Fight Christmas. And I let them dream of Christmas, the idea of snow in their heads. I let them dream of Christmas, a glorious Christmas. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, just like the ones I used to know. May your days be merry and bright. And may all your Christmases be white. Yes, a white Christmas. It was magical, that Christmas, because we were ready. We were ready. In February 1943, the offensives were to be launched. But something happened. Something went wrong. All of a sudden, the Iraq defensive bogged down. It was stopped by the Japanese. It wasn't moving forward. And the offensive from Imphal was cancelled. And then Chiang Kai-shek cancelled Stilwell's offensive with the Chinese from China. Stilwell, he was furious. Furious, man, furious. All he could say was, damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Articulate man, Stilwell. But I was not to be dissuaded. 
I was not to be dissuaded. I went to General Wavell and I said, we should go anyway, sir. We should go behind the Japanese lines anyway. Nonsense about the offensive. We can go back there and we can blow things up. We can destroy the Japanese supply line. We can do it, sir. We can do it. And Wavell had always supported me. He was a jolly character, a World War I hero. And he wore a tan campaign hat and carried a riding stick. And he said, I don't know, Wingate. I don't know, I don't know. And I said, oh, Wavell, please. General Wavell, please, I beg upon you. Please, 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 let me invade. I will set those people free. I'll go in there and liberate the Burmese. I'll make the Japanese wish they never come to Burma. I will bring victory, finally, victory to the British. Yes, 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 you fire me. You fire me, Wingate. You fire me. <laughs> invade, 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 invade. Petri, petri, petri. <laughs> Thank you, General. Thank you. I could always bring out the enthusiasm in General Wavell. So we are going behind enemy lines to break the myth of Japanese invincibility. Everybody was convinced of it because they conquered the world. But we were going to show that they couldn't win every battle. So in February 1943, we crossed the Chinwin River in our floats across the river, across the river, leaving behind Burma, beautiful Burma, lovely Burma that we all adored so much. That lovely, lovely land drifting behind us. This is a very good map because it shows all the different things uh, that uh, Burma produces. And over here, uh, you can see uh, fried chicken. Yes, yes. And uh, 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 they produce in the East at Prosecco. Prosecco is available in the East. And uh, roses and uh, nutter butters. Yes, uh, it's a very valuable map. I'll leave this up here for future reference. As we leave it behind, we're leaving behind Burma. Glorious Burma and swimming across the Chindwin River on our invasion, our invasion into Burma. Yes, the British were back in Burma, but we didn't confront the Japanese immediately. They were nowhere to be seen. Our first adversary was the Burmese jungle coming in on us and surrounding us and attacking us. It was so thick we couldn't get through it. It felt like it was strangling us. So I told the men, get your machetes. Get your machetes, men, and beat back the jungle. Don't let the jungle defeat you. Don't let it die. <laughs> Uh, there we go, there we go. <laughs> vicious orchid, vicious orchid. <laughs> the machete was the only way of getting through that channel. The worst adversary at first than the Japanese. I took 3,000 men with me, 3,000 highway trained men, and a thousand animals horses and mules mostly, but also my favorite, my favorite animal on the campaign because it reminded me so much of the greats, the elephant! Give me elephants, give me elephants. <laughs> I love my elephants. So regal, so large, so impressive. They made me feel like I was Alexander invading, invading India, or Hannibal on his elephants descending from the Alps, conquering ancient Rome. There was something so ancient about them, so glorious. Oh, these elephants. So we've crossed, and our first obstacle was the massive Zibi Mountains. We'd have to go up to the top of those mountains. And so we started to ascend up, 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 up the mountains, up, 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 with our heads above the clouds. We were at the top of the Zibi Mountains, and then we went down, down, down the other side, down the other side of the mountains. And there we were, finally on the plain. And there we were, right at the main railway. And I told my men, let's blow it up. Let's blow up the railway. Now let's blow it up. Let's destroy the railway. And we found railway track everywhere. And we put dynamite on it. And we destroyed the railway. <laughs> And then we found bridges, bridges across the Irrawaddy. And I said, blow them up, blow them up. So we placed the charges. We got out our plungers and we... <laughs> it 
was very satisfying work, blowing things up, and I knew it would be. And then we were ready for our first airdrop because we were running low on supplies. So I called to the RAF. I radioed them, broadsword calling Danny Boy, broadsword calling Danny Boy, airdrop, airdrop, airdrop. And the RAF flew in and they dropped. The supplies right on the drop zone. They didn't miss it at all. The drop zone captured. They flew in and they air dropped us the supplies we needed. It was glorious, glorious. They came. All the supplies falling to us like magic, like magic. The supplies came in. They came in like magic, like magic. It was so satisfying. We took the supplies and they let us move forward. Now we were resupplied with bags of things, bags of things, bags, glorious bags. We took the supplies and we moved forward, 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 forward. Unfortunately, the, the Japanese were beginning to close in. So I told Ferguson, my second command, I said, night attacks, night attacks, get them at night. And Ferguson launched his first night attack against the Japanese, and he was glorious. <laughs> machine gun fire, machine gun fire, machine gun fire, machine gun fire. The Japanese couldn't see anything, and Ferguson threw those wonderful bombs at them. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Japanese were determined to counterattack, and they didn't do it at night. They attacked during the day. The next day, they came pouring across the plain, right across the plain in full daylight. I couldn't believe it. I told my men, get your guns. They must be stopped. Fire! There she gets, there she gets. It was hideous. It just kept coming. The slaughter was unending. They were fanatical. All of them killed. Not one surrendered. Not one. The slaughter was outrageous. Such brave, determined men, wasted, achieving nothing. And I talked to Ferguson the night of that slaughter. I was very upset by it. I said, why are we here, Ferguson? Why have we come? When I was in Palestine, I knew I was there because I've always loved the Old Testament. It's the stories my father read to me. It was the only time I ever connected with my father was when he read me those glorious stories. And there I was giving Zion to the Zionists, the Holy Land back to the Jews. And then when I fought in Ethiopia, I was giving Ethiopia to the Emperor Haile Selassie, a descendant of Solomon, King Solomon from the Old Testament. I knew exactly why I was there. But why are we here? Are we really going to achieve anything? Well, I don't know, so here's the thing you have to understand, Winget. These people need to be free. They need us to free them. But will we free them? I think we're just going in there to turn them back into a colony. That once we're done, the government will move in, and Burma will just be a colony again, like India. Just a colony all over again. I don't think so. No, there's one man, a very important man, who doesn't want that to happen. He's not going to let it happen. Who? He's not a British man, surely? Not one of those boobs with the monocles? Who? His name's Mr. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt. He's told Churchill that he can have supplies, all the supplies he needs to win the war, but he cannot re-establish any colonies. Roosevelt said he will not supply any nation trying to re-establish its colonies, its empire in the East. I didn't know that. That's marvelous, man. And that's the best guarantee that the Burmese will be Burmese after the war, that they'll be free. Roosevelt and the Americans. Of course, they've just been selfish. They don't want us to have an empire because they don't have one. But for whatever the reason, they're the guarantee. That's marvelous, folks. Burma for the Burmese, with the Americans as a guarantee. Hallelujah. Having been inspired once again to take the field, we attacked the city of Nankan, which was a major rail center deep, deep in Burma. We blew up more bridges and more, more railway track. Now for the first time, we're confronted with 
one of the precepts of my original training. We had wounded. We were going to have to leave the wounded behind. These brave men who'd come so far, bandaged, bandaged fighting with us, fighting so bravely, and we couldn't carry them back. It was impossible, we had to leave them. One of them was quite witty, he actually said, well, thank God, I won't have to walk anymore. It's all this marching, I'd rather stay. He had a good spirit. We left a note with them, pleading with the Japanese, appealing to their sense of honor. Unfortunately, most of the wounded we left behind were killed by the Japanese, tortured, starved to death. Two of them were crucified in a Burmese village. It was one of the toughest decisions I ever had to make. But I said that's what we do, and we had to do it. I said to Ferguson, we must push on to the Irrawaddy. We're doing marvelously well. The Irrawaddy, so the Irrawaddy is too far. It's just a little blue thing in the distance to us. It's too far, it's too far. No, we must move on, we must move on. We're doing magnificently. But the Irrawaddy is so far, sir, so far. Yes, and we must seize the Irrawaddy. We must cross it to prove that we can cross it. We have to prove we can do anything. We've got the Japanese on the run. We're inspiring the world. We must cross Irrawaddy. Listen to me, Ferguson. The most important aspect of it is we will have the training of crossing a major river. The Chinwin was not a major river. If we can cross the Irrawaddy and strike beyond it, we've proven we're capable of anything. The crossing of a major river. We pushed on towards the Irrawaddy and immediately three Japanese divisions turned away from the front to chase us, to chase us. And we had three Japanese divisions behind us attacking us, attacking us. Broadsword calling Danny Boy, broadsword calling Danny Boy. Airstrikes, airstrikes against the Japanese immediately. Please, please, airstrikes. The RAF sent in their latest fighter. To attack the Japanese. Explosions, explosions. <laughs> My planning was working magnificently, magnificently, but now. We were ready to cross the river, the Irrawaddy, and it was like magic. The Japanese were nowhere in sight. They'd been driven off by the Air Force. We swam across the Irrawaddy with our flirts, and we got to the other side, and now we were ready for another airdrop. So we had to seize the city of Bor to get a drop zone. We attacked Bor, and we drove off the Japanese. They fled us. They were now afraid of us. The invincible Japanese were figuring out that they weren't the only ones who were invincible. Then we called in for the air supply. Broadsword calling Daddy Boy. Airdrop. Airdrop in ball. But the Japanese counterattacked. And they seized the drop zone. And our glorious supplies, our wonderful supplies, suddenly fell into Japanese hands. All those beautiful supplies left to the Japanese. Even some bags were caught by the Japanese. It was heartbreaking. Also the heat was extreme. Outrageous amounts of heat. The sun beat down on us mercilessly. Mercilessly. The men were covered in sweat. Wet. Wet with sweat, dripping with sweat. There was very little water. And I told them to press on. Press on. And I became impatient with them. I lost all patience with these men that I love so much that I trained so hard. And I called them incompetent. You idiot! You idiot! I blamed them for my failure. You idiot! And some of those men I flogged. And Ferguson said, sir, you can't flog the men. You can't. They love you. They think of you as a father figure. I know. My father beat me, and I hated him. I hated myself for losing my temper that way, blaming them, those wonderful men. 
was glorious in their way. I have loved them and have beaten them. We must stop, sir. We must. The RAF phoned in. Broadsword. Yes, I... I understand. They told me they could no longer supply us. They could no longer defend us or supply us. It was goodbye to the Royal Air Force. They disappeared from being able to help us. Still, we trudged on under that merciless glare, that punishing heat. Punishing. And finally I decided we had to turn back. Back for India. We were too far. We were too far. Broadsword got in Danny Boy. We're turning back. We're headed back to the Irradi. We're going to cross it and return to India. Cover us when you can. I sent 1,000 men east to China. I thought there'd be a diversion for the Japanese. The Japanese would chase half of them and half with us. It would split the Japanese forces and the rest of the men came with me. And we trudged back. Back the way we came. Back. Back. But the hardest part. The hardest part was we couldn't take the animals. We would have to slaughter the animals. Those beautiful animals. And I insisted. I insisted that we do it with our bare hands. Because we couldn't make the noise necessary to shoot them. Those beautiful animals. Those stunning elephants that I loved so much. We prayed, we prayed over the animals, and then we killed them with our bare hands. And we ate them. I insisted that we eat them. Elephant steaks we had. We consumed what we'd killed. The most glorious animals gave us strength. They gave us strength to work our way back, back, back to the Irrawaddy. And we were going to cross, we were going to cross, and Ferguson meant a night attack to divert the enemy from our crossing. Night attacks, night attacks. Explosions, explosions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a horrible night. That horrible night when the Japanese launched the flare. When the flare went into the air and caught us in the middle. And so many of my men had drowned, drowned in the air of Drowned, drowned. And the rest of us had swam ashore. And that vicious sun, the rising sun, had come up the next morning with us trapped a hundred miles behind Japanese lines. It was nights for us, it was darkness because we were lost. But I knew what the men really need was rest, that they were exhausted, burnt, and with rest, they'd be restored. We'd swum back, we were on the wrong side of the river, we were a hundred miles from getting home, trapped behind Japanese lines, but we took a seven day vacation and we relaxed. I told the men, there's nothing that rest, that sleep cannot cure. Also, key to a cure was a good cup of English tea. We brewed up and we all enjoyed many cups of English breakfast tea. Mm. And we felt rest and invigoration flowing into us. We were once again in Britishers and we read we brought books with us. We had a marvellous library, and Mark Twain and Plato, and I read Plato to the men. I read to them, I read them the glorious, glorious, glorious words of that master ancient philosopher. We cannot help it, Socrates. Ah! Oh! They loved it, and they loved me for reading it to them. We were restoring ourselves. I said to Ferguson one night, I said, Ferguson, how did you become a soldier? He said, well, I think it must have been when I, um, I played war as a boy. That's when I first knew I wanted to be a soldier. Me too, me too. I didn't like my father. He was so cruel to me, except when he read me those Old Testament stories. And when I played war, I was inspired by him because he was a soldier. Yes, yes, mine was too, yes. War as boys, quite different from war in actuality. War as men. Yes, sir. 
I dare say so. Yes. Well, Ferguson, back to work. So, Ferguson and I got the men up, and we marched. That training paid off, because we marched, marched, marched back to the river. And I decided we crossed the same place we tried to cross before, because the Japanese would never think we would do that. And we were successful, because we floated across, floated across, and they were never the wiser. And we made it, we made it to the correct side of the Irrawaddy. And now, now we would have to march, march all the way back to the Jinwin, march back to India. And we did. Through that blazing heat, I was so tired. I found myself a staff. I made my men with my staff. And they suddenly looked like an Old Testament hero, a prophet leading his men to the promised land. We'd been two and a half months behind Japanese lines, two and a half months trapped behind the Japanese, but we taught them, we taught them that they weren't the only ones who were invincible. In fact, they were invincible. We were the invincible ones. And finally, one day I saw it, the Chinwin River, one of the places where we got our name, the Chindits. And I said to my men, there in the blue mist lies the Jordan. And beyond is our promised land. I was Moses, leading my men, leading my men to the holy land. But we weren't there yet. We still had to get through the elephant grass, that vicious, vicious jungle. That jungle prevented us from even getting to the river. It scraped us, it cut us. And yay, yay, we were bleeding from their wounds, covered in cuts and wounds. And when we got down to the river, we'd have to swim across because we had no more rafts. So we stripped down full nudity. We stripped down to nothing so that we could swim across the Chinwin River. I'm, I'm, I'm actually naked now. I'm, oh, here, I'll show you. Oh, no, no, just take my word for it. I'm naked. And we swam across the Chinwin River, and we were back in India. Back where we started. We'd made it. We'd made it. We'd made it back from Burma, covered in glory. And I went to the local villages, and I found headmen who could provide us with boats, Burmese and Indian boats, because many of my men couldn't swim. It's an amazing phenomenon, but many Englishmen don't swim. So I sent the boats back to pick up the men, to pick up the men and bring them back, bring back the rest of the army. The Japanese launched an attack in the middle of this operation. <laughs> But it was too late. They'd failed. They'd failed to stop us. We were the invincible ones. And Ferguson blew up one last railway. And one last bridge. It was glorious. And on the shores greeting us was the British Army, welcoming us back from our victory. And newsmen, newsmen from Britain and America with their cameras, their cameras taking pictures of us. Apple, camera. Apples have cameras in them. Yes, makes sense. Yes, yes. Dozens of cameras. And I was photographed by everybody. And I ended up on the cover of Life magazine and Time Magazine. And they called it a triumph, a glorious triumph. We had won, we'd proven that the Japanese were not invincible. We brought victory, victory to British arms in Burma. But the price was, was horrible. I looked at the casualties. Of 3,000 men I'd taken in, I brought back 2,182. Of a thousand animals, I brought back none. The cost was enormous. Still, people, people didn't want to think about the cost. 
And eventually I thought less of it because I saw what we brought to the British people. The photos went around the world, not just on the covers, but everywhere, newsreels. The British Army was famous now because of my long range penetration groups. And the BBC even had a German radio station and they broadcast to the Germans, to the Germans, to the allies of the Japanese, they broadcast to them. Vingate ran circles around Japanese, subsisting on the diet of python steaks, vulture cutlets, and roast elephant. Well, I had eaten elephant and thought it was darn good. Vulture cutlets? No. Still, it made the Germans think about their allies and their invincibility. And the British at home were inspired by us. They saw that the war in Burma could be won. And the Americans were inspired that their allies were now pushing the Japanese back from the east as they pushed from the west. It was magnificent. And the Indians, the Indians saw that the British could defend India, that the Japanese would not conquer India, that the British could defend it. It was glorious. And then I received a cable from Mr. Churchill, the Prime Minister. He wanted to see me, he wanted to see me again. He'd sent me there in the first place and he wanted me to come home. So I flew home to England. Planes, 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 planes. And when I landed in London, there was a cable from him saying, join me, join me in my country house. Yes, yes, you're quite right. His country house, that famous country house of his. I was invited there. Yes, I was invited to Checkers. The Churchill family country house. And there he was with that massive cigar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To greet me at Checkers. Mm -hmm. Wingate, welcome. Welcome to Checkers. Do you like Checkers? Do you like it? This is a marvelous estate. Marvelous. It reminds me of something. I can't think what, sir. Checkers reminds me of something. It reminds people, many people, of something. That's the glory of Checkers. Now, you must tell me about your victory, your victory, your victory in Burma. I want to hear all about it. Go ahead. So I told him. I told him all about my victory, my glorious victory. And I said to him, sir, one thing you have to understand is that we can win the war in Burma using these same tactics, just on a larger scale. The men are good if they're trained. The Japanese are not invincible. I want to go back, sir. I want to go back. And he was so enthralled with my story that as he listened, he smoked down his cigar to almost a stump. Wendy, you will return. You will return. I'm sending you back. I'm sending you back. But first, first, there's somebody I want you to meet. I want you to join me. I'm off to Quebec for the Quadrant Conference. I'm meeting the American general staff and a great man. I'm there to have a conference with Mr. Roosevelt, the president. Nah, 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 nah. I want you to meet him. So I was off. I was off to meet the president, that wonderful man, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And I was the guest, the guest of the greatest man of the 20th century, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Thank you for joining me for Ord in Burma. I conclude Ord's story next week with the end of Ord, his return to Burma and his tragic fate. But thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Theodore Rhinoceros has another program coming up that's uh, this Saturday night at eight o'clock on Zoom and it's called Steam. It's a wonderful play, two actor play on Zoom. And you can check that out at therhino.org. If you'd like to support Theodore Rhinoceros, and these are challenging times, as you can imagine, for nonprofits during COVID-19, you can do so by sending us a contribution. Uh, you can find out about that on our website, therhino.org. That's T-H-E. R-H-I-N-O dot org. And there's a donate button. And we'd certainly appreciate your support. It keeps us going. It keeps us going just as it keeps org going in these difficult times. But thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm John Fisher, and this has been Ord 
in Burma.